Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And welcome to today's information session in support of the Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program at Columbia University. My name is David Taylor Tumulty, and I work as an admissions, as a director, as associate director of admissions and recruitment at the School of Professional Studies. And before we get going with today's webinar, um, I just wanted to check that you can hear me. So if you can, let us know in the chat box or Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Just type in yes. And as you do that, it would be great if you can let us know where in the world you are joining us from. That's also always wonderful to see. All right, you can hear me. That's a start. Okay. Brooklyn, Japan. Wonderful. Ithaca. All right, we've got a nice little selection from all over the world. So before we get into today's webinar, uh, just wanted to give you a quick overview of some of our housekeeping rules, as well as our agenda. So just in terms of today's housekeeping, today's webinar is being recorded. So if you need to log out before we conclude, you will receive a copy of the recording within the next few working days. We'll be running through uh, a pretty brief range of subjects. This webinar will take around 45 to 50 minutes. As we work our way through the webinar, please feel very welcome and uh, very welcome to type any questions that you may have for us into the Q&A box towards the bottom of your screen. We will talk a little bit about the admissions process and application requirements, so you can keep your admissions related questions to that time. But if you do have questions about the program or curriculum or faculty, as we make our way through the, the webinar, please do put those questions into the Q&A and we will have space to pick up those questions. So if we don't respond to any questions via chat, there's a good chance that we've held your question back or we're going to address it during the Q&A component. So just a quick overview of what we're gonna to do today. We'll just have a very brief overview of program leadership for the Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program. We'll go through a broad overview of what the program is, what it looks like, how the curriculum is shaped. We'll talk a little bit about the School of Professional Studies. We'll also conclude with some notes on the admissions process and an overall Q&A that you may um, of questions that you may have that we have not yet resolved. And just to give you some sense of who our program is made up of, we have a, a pretty concise, intimate team, um, as you'll find as you make your way during your application journey. This is a program that likes to hear from you. We want to talk to you. We want to continue our conversations with you. So we're joined by a wonderful range of professionals who are here to help you during the application journey, uh, during the post-admission stage, as well as supports that you would require as you make your journey through the semesters of the program. So there's a good chance that you'll hear from most of the people in this slide at some point during your journey, that's either as an applicant or as an active enrolled student in the program. So I'll pause here and hand over to Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida, who's the program director, who will take us through the rest of today's agenda. Thank you so much, David. So welcome, everybody. So glad you're here to join us to hear about the program. I always like talking about the program. This is a little bit about my background. Basically, I'm sorry, do you hear that drilling? They're drilling next door. Sorry. Um, anyway, so I, I came to the field through the area of intercultural communications, and that's how I got into intercultural conflict and then into conflict resolution and negotiation. Can you please go to the next slide? All right, so we have three main buckets of how we categorize the skills and content that we'll cover in the program. One is that we take you through a series of courses and different kinds of tools to use to really analyze conflict and understand the root causes. And it's really important to understand the root causes and not just the symptoms. Of course, the symptoms are how they man and manifest itself, but the root causes are important. And then we understand the dynamics of conflict because conflict doesn't stay still. There are dynamics to it. And through the analysis, you get to understand where is an opportunity to intervene and in what way. And then through the different methodologies we practice and teach, then we like to think about how do you 
identify these conflicts and then transform them through reason resourceful interventions. And that means that it's a collaborative approach. It means that we try to have a win-win kind of situation. And we also try to advance sustainability, which happens in the next bucket there, so that whatever change we're trying to foster through the intervention, the sustainability methods and approaches really holds that change. Next slide. So if any one of these buckets you feel that you're not quite there yet, well, then you're perfect for the program because we always have opportunities to learn more. I've been in the field for many years and I always learn something more from students, from other faculty, from other practitioners, and just from applying the methods that we use. So in these different squares, you can see that it really is a dynamic curriculum. We're constantly modifying the curriculum a little bit here and there to tweak it to make sure that we're up to date and relevant to what's needed in the world today. And as you look around in the world today, you can see there's a lot of conflict resolution that's needed. All of our faculty are actively practicing in the field in some way or another. They could be doing mediation, they could be doing training, they could be doing teaching, they could be doing arbitration, and also research in different ways and different kinds of research. It's very supportive, as David mentioned, we have a team that's totally dedicated to NECR, so you, I think, from what I've heard from students and then alumni when they graduate is that they feel and have felt very supported in the program. We do try to individualize as much as possible to really suit your needs. And you'll see that when we look at the flexibility in the curriculum, talking about constructive communication, we all know how to communicate ineffectively. We're trying to master the art of communicating effectively so we don't have to go to the ineffective methods. And everything is very practice oriented, but grounded in research and theory and some of it is original research and theory that comes out of Columbia University, one of our partner organizations, the MDI Triple CR. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Here you can see an array of our faculty who are actively teaching this semester and if we go one more click we can also see the variety of backgrounds and areas within which the faculty work. And this probably is not even capturing everything. This was just a brainstorm that all the different things that we're doing. And you can see that the field of negotiation and conflict resolution itself can be applied in so many different ways. You, as you can see here, that maybe it talks about diversity and equity, because when you have diversity and equity issues, you probably have conflict. And then also people may need to negotiate for more equity within their organization. Or you can see nonviolent communication as a methodology and approach to how we communicate. Or you can see facilitation. Very often we may not be mediating, but we may be trying to facilitate conversations. How do you learn those facilitation skills? You'll have a chance to do that. So all of our faculty collectively work across these areas. And I would say most of these areas at any given time are addressed in some way or another in the program through your coursework, depending on which courses you take in, as electives beyond the core curriculum. Next slide, please. I'm going to invite one of our current faculty and an alum of the program, Courtney, to tell you a little bit about her career trajectory so you can see how it relates to you, what she was doing before she decided to join the program, her experience, and then after. So I'll turn it over now to Courtney. Thank you, Beth, and thank you for inviting me to this, um, this event. Um, and it's nice to meet all of you participants. My name is Courtney Chickvac, and I'm the instructor for the online um, asynchronous um, foundations uh, course for Capstone. So this would be one of the first courses that you would take starting in January. Uh, my, tr my career tra trajectory has been interesting um, and um, unusual in some ways. Uh, so I took my first basic mediation training when I was in college. I was about 20 years old at the time, and I saw a flyer. I attended Cornell University, the ILR school. I saw a flyer for the Scheinman Institute hosting a free basic mediation training, and I went and I absolutely loved it. Um, at the time, I was told that if I wanted to pursue mediation, I had to be a lawyer, um, and there was no no other way. So I went to law school at St. John's and I studied labor and employment law. And um, I was also involved in the ADR program at St. John's. And after I graduated, I realized that if I wanted to pursue being a mediator, being a lawyer wasn't enough. And so I enrolled in the program 
Uh, I worked full time in labor and employee relations, and I went to school at night. Um, and after I graduated from the program, I felt like there were so many new opportunities that were available to me. Um, I started mediating. I began as a volunteer mediator at Long Island Dispute Resolution Centers, which is the Community Dispute Resolution Center for Nassau and Suffolk County on Long Island. Um, and then they hired me part time. Now I oversee 50 volunteer mediators and apprentices, all of our training programs, and I'm on a lag a little bit because I've been delivering the basic mediation training, training all of our new mediators um, this week and next week. Um, in addition to that, I teach in the program. I also uh, began um, teaching at several other universities online. Um, I also was asked just through my teaching work to um, start negotiation and conflict resolution coaching. And so I've coached at probably six or seven universities, Stanford Law School, Yale School of Man Management. Um, I've taught all over the world. Um, there was a course in, in Japan that I worked on, a course in India. I've judged mediation competition in Vienna. Um, and so in addition to all of that, I also mediate in my own business. And so I am part of a number of the state court, New York state court roster program. So they refer me cases. I also get private referrals as well. So if you're wondering if I sleep, not really, not really. I'm always very busy. Um, and it just shows that there's such a demand for this type of, of work. Like Beth was saying, there's so much conflict Literally before this, I got another email today for another referral. That's for a divorce case. Um, so there's so much to be done in this field, and there are so many opportunities. So I, I think I covered everything. <laughs> thank you, Courtney, that you covered everything until you study your next direction that you're going to study in. So thank you so much. Thank you. So what Courtney was talking about was just one example of the enthusiasm and energy and passion that people have for the program and the different directions they can go in. And sometimes people ask me, well, what do you do with this career afterwards? And Courtney is one example, but one of many examples that we have in the program that's really vibrant people doing lots of different things. And I always say, well, you could do conflict resolution proper, which is a lot of what Courtney's doing, like mediations and arbitrations and training and being on a roster in the courts and so on. I myself have mediated the small claims court. And so then the other thing is you can do it in anything else you're doing, because if you see here, there is an example of some other alumni from the program and what they've done. And if you just look at some of their plates there, the, with the information about them, you can see that they're doing lots of different kinds of things. We have people who are COOs, and I know that Patricia started out in HR, so she was an HR professional who now took up a more senior role in an organization. And that's something that happens that when you deal with people and you communicate more effectively and you can manage conflict that you're in or on, on a team because sometimes you're not directly involved but definitely impacted then that gets noticed and that qualifies you for different kinds of leadership roles and i wish more of our leadership in general in all different realms could really practice better conflict resolution skills because they would be able to sort of nip things in the bud before they escalated so on our website, which David can refer you to later, you can also see many other profiles of alumni from the program. And once you're in the program, and even if you're interested beforehand, uh, you can ask us uh, to connect you with an alumni, depending on what it is you want to know, then we would know which alumni to connect you with so that person can speak more directly to your interest. So next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that we have some original research, and that's from the MDI CCCR that's listed here in the middle. So we have different partners around the university. The MDI CCCR is one. It's situated at Teachers College, and actually, that's the center that our program was birthed from. So we created the master's program because there was so much more attention being paid to conflict resolution over the years and a demand for more than just a course or a certificate. People wanted a whole master's program and then people still want to do extra training because sometimes people just want to continue their lifelong learning, which is good and continuing to hone their skills. We also have a consortium, AC4, that we're part of. I'm also directly involved in AC4 running the Youth Peace and Society program. And then if any of you are available tonight on October 19th, there is a book launch that I will be 
speaking at with my colleague Juan Lopez and our book just came out about peace building in Colombia. One of our newer partners is the Center for Justice. We've always had a little bit of social justice attention paid in our courses and now we're more fully exploring that whole realm and the intersection between social justice and conflict resolution. So where is their advocacy and where is their way to mediate and so on. So that just tells you that there's a rich culture and practice at the university for negotiation and conflict resolution. We are by no means a um, isolated program. So the way the curriculum is set up right now is that we have four core courses and then three capstone courses and this will remain and it's about half the program or a little bit more than half the program and we take you through a series of foundational theory courses and also some practice courses and then the capstone series is a way to really mirror an intervention with anything you might be doing outside in the real world right so you take a situation you figure out what's going on, you analyze it, and you surface different kinds of needs there and the actors and their needs. And then in the second part, you identify and develop different kinds of interventions to meet the needs that surfaced in the first part of the analysis. And then, as I think I mentioned earlier about sustainability, we're very much about not going in, fixing things and running out and it collapses. We want to sustain the change that we've made, which also could involve building capacity, institutionalizing certain practices and so on. So these are the core courses that everybody goes through. And then we have in the next slide, please, a series of electives that you can choose from. So currently it is 19 credits and you have three different groupings of courses from systems, skills, social justice, as I mentioned before. And it's kind of a loose sort of assembly. You can take all of your credits in one of these areas or you can spread them across. And in addition, you can see on the bottom we mentioned here that if you're interested, sometimes there's a course in another program or another school at the university that you're interested in taking and you can, as long as it's pre-approved, and we do have a list of pre-approved electives for you, and it's all dependent upon availability because you should know that every school and every program privileges their students first. So like we would always make room for an NECR student in our course, and then that would be the same if you wanted to take a, a course at the School of International Public Affairs or the law school. It really depends on space availability and whether the instructor is open to having external students, because sometimes there are prerequisites and an assumption about a shared learning base that you need to have. So lots of different opportunities. And when you come into the program, you meet with a advisor, Andy, and Andy Hammer will take you through and you will use something called Stella, which is a platform that you sort of map out the courses you think you'll be taking through the, your tenure in the program. And probably during the first semester, you'll make a change or so because then you talk to other people, which is great. We like you to talk to other people and you hear about other courses and then you say, oh, that sounds really interesting. I didn't know about that. And then you may want to change which is fine, you can do that. Next slide, please. And the capstone project that I did mention, our program is probably one of the only master's programs, I'm not mistaken, that has this kind of capstone project. And it really is a very applied research oriented project. It's based on case studies and you first research and, and analyze a certain conflict. What we do is we start you out with one of three case studies. It could be an organizational, community, or international level conflict. You choose one that resonates with you, or some people have said, you know what, I don't have any experience in this one, so I'm going to go study that one. And then as you go through that first semester, you have a chance to decide. You work in a group and individually, and then you decide before you finish there, am I going to stay with this case study, which you're welcome to do, and take your own individual turn, or am I going to change to a different topic? Sometimes people enter the program with a particular topic in mind and they want to continue pursuing that and that's fine as long as it's a fit for the capstone design. Sometimes there are topics that are super interesting but not necessarily fit so we make sure that there's a fit. 
After you go through that analysis and you surface the needs, you enter into the middle part of the capstone where you design interventions. And that's always interesting. And in your design of an intervention, you want to make sure it directly fits the need you're addressing. And you also want to make sure, how am I monitoring and evaluating to make sure that the intervention I designed is really hitting the mark, is really doing what I expected it to do? Where do I need to tweak it to make it more suitable? And then you also think about the sustainability and the networking. And this ends in a wonderful presentation, which everybody celebrates you. And you also hand in a 60 to 80 page thesis. Now, sometimes people hear the number of pages and they freak out, but not a worry because as you go through the process, you're going to be creating the pages. So they're just going to be flying off of your printer. So no problem at all. But also we use digital, so it won't fly off your printer, but it will fly through the ethernet or the internet to uh, us, which is great. And the next slide. So then um, in spring, we have our hybrid intake, which some of you are probably interested in. That's why you're in this information session. But if you're not and you want to go from the fall in person, that's fine too. Uh, we all have this. It's the same 14 courses. It's the same amount of time unless you're doing the speedy track. And it takes you over four to seven semesters. And it's probably like six to 10 hours a course per week when you think about reading or group work or thinking or writing or doing assignments and so on. And usually what happens at the beginning, we are more directive in which courses we want you to take because we want you to have that nice foundation for the program. And then you build your electives on top of that. And the next slide, please. And this is what it looks like. So in the green boxes are the required courses and the blue are the electives. And you can see that after the first semester, it's pretty spread out. And depending on the semester and what happens, then we can shift things around. Because sometimes certain electives are only offered certain semesters, so we'll work with you on that. Please note that in semester two, which is the summer, it's on campus and that's an intensive block week classes. We have a special design for that, but also electives available should you choose to stay and take an elective. And then that goes through. Also in the summer two, the semester two summer, we have our peace building practicum, which we have in different places around the world. Next summer, we have two trips, maybe three planned. One will be to Japan to work on environmental conflict resolution concerns and sustainability related to the sustainability goals of the United Nations, the SDG. And then we also have a trip to Colombia, working with youth leaders in communities in Colombia, Medellin and Bogota. And then we may have another one more locally. We're still working on that one. Next slide, please. And so the on-campus program full-time, which starts in full, but it's not too early to learn about it now and start your application process. The same courses, it just shakes out in different ways because it can be a little bit more intensive and full-time. Same amount of time you're spending per course per week, because remember it's the same course load and the same syllabi. The only difference is that the design of the course is a little bit different to suit being online so we really take online it's not just slapping a program um, on the internet it's really designed to be an online course and the school excels in online learning design so i feel confident in that next slide please and this is what that sequence would look like should you come a regular full term full time rather through in person starting in the fall and you can see that it shakes out in different semesters, but the same kind of a flow across the programs. We're very intentional and parallel in what we do between the in-person and online programs. Whatever we offer pretty much in person, we also offer online. And yes, the next slide, you can go to the three terms. Now, some people only have one year to do what they need to do. And so they come in in the fall, they do spring and summer, and that's it because they can only get away for one year or for whatever reasons they have in their lives. They do an intensive. It can work, and I think it's better to have it this way than not to have any at all. So you do very intensive learning. It does take a certain kind of self-discipline in order to really stay on top of your learning. And it also means that you probably would not have time for as many extracurricular activities, but some, because there are many, many things happening around campus. And you probably would not be able to do an internship where some people do like to do that. So the others a little bit more spread out would suit you better. But if you only have that one year, then this is the course for you, the course flow. Next slide. 
and that's what it looks like here for part-time again it's the same 14 courses and it just spreads out differently but the same amount of time per week next slide please and that's what this looks like if you're part-time sometimes we have employees from columbia university who take two courses a semester sometimes we have people who are local living in new york city and working in new york city and working full-time or with a heavier load that they can't afford to spend more time in school so they want to take it and they do it usually two courses per semester and we work with you on that flow as well and next slide Okay, so now we're opening up to program Q&A and i um, happy to answer questions and David will chime in here as well if there's something that he will uh, answer. So will it be okay to email professors with whom I want to study? I would say that a first stop would be to work through David and then to work through the program staff. But if there is a burning desire to be in touch with a faculty member, we will reach out to the faculty member and make sure that it's okay. I can't imagine a faculty member saying no. I think it's just a matter of coordinating it. And we also want to be sensitive to the faculty members so that everybody is not directly emailing faculty members. But they are open and they're very happy to speak with people as are current students and alumni as well as the program staff. So please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions at all. There are so many people who can answer them. Okay, uh, somebody wrote in about a particular, okay, so I'm not going to go into all the details here because it's a personalized situation. However, what I will say is that when we do admissions, we have a composite of many different criteria that fit together. And so uh, if you are freshly graduated undergrad, then I would say that your GPA from your undergrad is probably weightier in consideration than if you've been out five or more years and have other kinds of work experience. When you have that, then the GPA is a distant pass and you already have other valuable experiences. So we really do consider lots of different criteria. I wouldn't only base it on one. If you feel that as a total package, you have a good application, please put it in. And I would also encourage you in your personal statement, if you have any extenuating circumstances that you think influence your performance in the past for whatever reasons, I would put that in the personal statement so we are aware of why your GPA may have dipped or we're aware of why there was a gap in your learning or a gap in between learning and working. All good, you know, people have different ways of living their lives and we're not going to judge that. We just want to understand it to understand how you show up and what the fit is between you and the program and what you want to learn. So we're very open to having conversations about that. How well does this master's program? Well, you know what? In terms of diplomacy and foreign relations, I think everybody needs this program because I see the way some people talk to each other and it's not polite and not respectful and not helpful. So we do have um, a portion of the students in the program who are very interested in going into some kind of foreign relations, diplomacy work, NGO work, UN work, and so on. And we do address lots of things that can take place there uh, in those careers. Uh, many of our faculty have political science and international relations backgrounds, so that comes through in the material that they cover and how they talk about the cases that they look at. And also, um, you have an option to take some courses at SEPA, School of International Public Affairs, if there's something there that more directly meets your needs. So together, I mean, I think it's a very strong foundation to go into foreign relations and diplomacy. Diversity in the student body. You know, one of the things I absolutely love about the program is naturally it just attracts people from all around the world. And, and so we have, I would say, maybe half of the program are international. We keep doing, I, I always do this anecdotally, and then when we look at the, the numbers, it kind of pans out. So we have people from all around the U.S. and we have people from all around the world in all different combinations. And I think that's one of the exciting parts about the program is the diversity of the backgrounds of the students. There is not an internship requirement, but if people want to have an internship, then we try to help situate you. We can't promise that, but um, we try to pay attention to that. And if you're working full time, we certainly don't expect you to quit your job and do an internship. And there might be ways of using your work situation in some of your coursework, which is something that we're interested in working on. Okay, what qualities make them a strong candidate when they have less experience? So we're not only looking at experience, right? We're looking at 
what you've learned before, what was your course of study, why do you want to take this program, and really be explicit as much as you can. You may not know exactly the role you want to play, but you know you want to work in the field for whatever reasons. It's probably good to have had at least one internship in the past one or two, because we do look that you've had some other context to understand the material other than school. If you have school and family, of course you can understand the material, but if you have any kind of work experience, it helps. It doesn't mean five years, it could be one semester or a summer or two summers or a year. We, remember, we take that all into consideration with your um, personal statement, with your grades, with your recommendation letters. You have an online interview, like a one minute kind of a video interview that you do and so on. So we look at everything. Okay, are there any other questions at this time or do we want to turn it over to David? And I see that if you look in the uh, chat area, there also are some links to different areas here. In the three week, I just want to jump in here and answer this one question. So the three week has turned into a two week intensive and the day-to-day -day. it's a combination of courses uh, each course is more than one day and it's roughly nine to five however our intentional design is that it's very experiential so you do preparation work beforehand like watching videos and getting some instructional lectures through that means so when you are on campus in the course it's all hands-on and doing a lot of role plays and reflection and so on and um yeah, so it's, that's what's good. And then you have follow-up writing. So while you're here on campus, it's very hands-on, and many people say they can't believe the day flew by. So now I'll turn it over to David. Thank you, Beth, and thank you to everyone with your questions so far. This neatly takes us through to our admission slides. And before I go into more details about the application process and what that looks like, um, it, it, it doesn't hurt to stop and maybe think about, you know, who takes this program what our student body looks like. So I'm not gonna repeat everything line by line on this slide, um, but it's just to reflect the fact that within the program, we do have a wonderful diversity in terms of who our students are, where they are drawn from and what their motivations may be. So we often find that some of the most recurring characteristics in our applicants would include those who may be in early in their career, or they may be a little bit later in their career, who have at some point identified the importance of having negotiation and conflict resolution skills, whatever their industry or role may be, they see the value and importance of having those attributes. And so they come into the program because they wanna pick up those attributes to excel in where they currently are in their career and within their industries. We'll also have mid-career professionals who very much feel the same way, but they may also want to augment their existing experience to come back to school, to take uh, a better understanding of the broader conversations that relate to uh, negotiation, conflict resolution, and to take that information back into their current roles or to expand in what they're doing and where they want to go. And of course, we also have individuals who are seeking a career pivot or a career change who want to perhaps leverage the skills and experiences that they've already picked up in their current roles. And they want to be able to take a brand new set of skills into the direction that they want to travel next. So we do see a wonderful array of backgrounds and perspectives that come into this program with each of our application intakes. And also not to forget, we also do have recent undergraduates who join the program as well, who may not have a lot of professional experience, but they will often have some relevant uh, internship experience or volunteer experience, which will connect to the themes of the program. And as they work their way through the application process, are able to leverage those experiences into their statement of purpose and perhaps into the supplemental essay to give us a better idea of what their motivations are and why they're pursuing this program. So that takes us into broad overview of the application. I'm not going to get into a micro level overview of the application process. Everything that I go through today, you will find in much more substantial detail on our program web pages, as well as the application itself. And at the end of the webinar, we will share our program contact details. So if you do have questions, if you're not sure about something, we're always here to help you make it make sense so that you can get your application moving forward. So first things first, this is a completely online application. We do not accept paper materials in any form. 
we will ask for a $150 non-refundable application fee. And just to clarify, you will not pay that money to open your application. You can open your application today, take a look around, see what it looks like, get a sense of it before you actually start the process of getting your information in there. You would pay that fee once you were submitting the application. And in order for your application to begin the review, you, you would pay that fee at that point. We're going to take a look at your academic background. That's going to be an important part. It's not the only part that we're looking at, but your academics will be important and will help to inform how we evaluate your candidacy. So we will need copies of all of your post-secondary education transcripts. So in other words, your undergraduate transcripts. If you've completed a master's degree or you are in the process of doing so, we want to take a look at your master's transcript as well. If you're graduating from an institution from within the United States, it is enough for us to see unofficial copies of those transcripts. So that's where you have uploaded that transcript yourself. That's unofficial. That would be enough for application review. However, if you have graduated or will graduate from an institution outside the United States, you will be required to go one step further, and that's to obtain what we call a WES transcript evaluation. WES is a third party organization, World Education Services. They do two things for us. First, they will confirm that your transcript is true and authentic, that it comes from a real university. And that might sound strange. You might say, of course, my university is real. Um, but, but every year we do, we do see people attempt to pass off uh, inauthentic transcripts. So we're going to confirm that your transcript is authentic. Second, we will do, they will do a great equivalency as well. So whether you're graduating from an institution in India or China or Britain or elsewhere, that's just to ensure that we fully see what your grades mean when they're converted into the US GPA grading scale. And that also applies to US citizens. So if you are a US citizen and you graduated from an institution in Canada or Germany or wherever it might be, that WES requirement will also apply to you. If you have questions about that, we can take those at any time. It can get quite detailed, um, but we're happy to troubleshoot that for you. We also want to see a copy of your most recent up-to-date resume or CV. We're not too concerned about the format or how you present that. What matters more is that it's up-to-date. We can see everything about what you're doing. And that's also inclusive of extracurricular activities um, that may also help to give us a better idea of who you are, what you're doing, and how you stand as an overall candidate to the program. We're also looking for two letters of recommendation. We do not require or accept three. It's two is the limit. What that looks like is slightly different between spring 2024 admission and fall 2024 admission. So the difference you will find when you read through the application requirements. But for those of you who are looking at a spring 2024 application submission, we're going to look for um, one undergraduate letter of recommendation if you have completed your undergraduate degree less than five years ago. If it's more than five years since you've graduated from your undergraduate program, then we will not require an academic letter of recommendation. And instead, two professional letters of recommendation will be sufficient. If you are going to get an academic letter of recommendation, it should come from someone who has taken you for at least one semester of class, who can speak to your strengths as an academic. If you're going to get uh, letters, professional letters of recommendation, they must come from someone who has worked with you in a direct supervisory capacity. There can be some exemptions to this. So for example, if you have started your own company and you are your own boss, then we will look at some exemptions for perhaps working with clients that you've worked closely with over a reasonable period of time can be accepted in lieu of a recommender who has been a supervisor. And we can get into those details outside of this afternoon's call. You're going to be asked to complete a statement of academic purpose where you will be given a specific prompt. You'll be asked to highlight the reasons why you have selected this program, why you're pursuing the application, the skills and attributes that you would bring as a valued member of the program, and also what you're hoping to get out of the program. So what are your goals? How can this program help to bring you closer to those goals? We will also ask you to submit a supplemental essay, and that is going to ask you to describe um, the most significant professional challenge 
that you face in a current or previous role and how you've overcome that. It's important to respond to the prompts that you have received. If you don't have any professional work experience, and perhaps it's limited to internships, or it might be within the realm of your degree, we can accept that as well. But please do listen to the, to the prompts and respond to the prompts. We occasionally do have applicants who ignore this. And what will happen is their supplemental essay will be declined and they will be asked to submit a new one. So pay attention to the prompts, ensure you're responding to those so that we don't hold up your application um, for this reason. You will be asked to submit a video essay uh, that is not something to get too stressed out about. This is not something that you can really prepare for. And the video essay will be a random prompt. We have 200 of those. You will hear one of those. You will be given 60 seconds to hear that question. You will be given 60 seconds to think of your response. Then you will have 60 seconds to record that response. The question will not be academic in nature, nor will it be specific to a profession. And so, for example, it could be something like, um, what color best describes your personality type? So it is really something that you can prepare for, but it's something that we like to see. You can't really worry too much about that. Um, so have fun with that. I've been through it. I think a number of us here have been through it. it. It's actually quite fun. And it's really just to gauge your ability to think quickly on your feet and how you respond to something without prior preparation. If English is not your native language, we will require proof of your English language proficiency. So if you have graduated from an undergraduate program where English was the language of instruction for the entirety of that program, then a language waiver will apply. If that is not applicable to you, then we will look for either an IELTS or a TOEFL score. Um, and also finally, GRE and GMAT scores are optional. So if you have taken a GRE or GMAT test, and it is valid from within the last five years, you can submit that as part of your materials. We would accept that, but it's not something that we actively seek. Before I do conclude, there's one other point that I do wanna stress is that the application process is holistic, as Beth mentioned um, a little earlier. We take a look at multiple factors in the application. So if you feel that your GPA is a little underweight, it's a little underwhelming, that does not mean that your candidacy to the program will end there and then. We'll take a look at everything that your application materials show us. We're looking for reasons to admit you. We're not really looking for reasons to exclude you. So we're looking for reasons to add you into the program. So that's why we're looking for a range of materials so that we can see you in a stronger light as possible so that we can make as complete a decision as possible. And the final thing I will say about the application process is that we look at applications on a rolling basis. So we don't stop those applications and look at them periodical, periodically. Once you've submitted the application and your application is considered complete, in other words, we have everything that we're asking for, we begin the review process. And the review process can take between four to six weeks. It can sometimes take closer to eight weeks as we get closer to very busy application periods. But we are very efficient in our application reviews. And sometimes it could be the case that an application has completed its review and a decision has been reached before that four to six week period. But just to give you an idea of expectations, if you have submitted your application and you have questions, do you feel welcome to reach out and let us know. I'm just gonna finish up with some confirmation of deadlines. So if you are targeting your application for the spring 2024 intake, November 1st is our final deadline. Please keep this in mind. We do not accept applications after the final deadline. So if you have not started your application, but you want to get it in for November 1st, there, there is still time for that. But do reach out with any questions that you have so we can make sure we move you through as quickly as possible. For those of you who are thinking of fall 2024, you've got plenty of time. Um, the final deadline for fall 24 applications is May 1st. So again, plenty of time. If you are an international applicant, we would encourage an earlier submission by March 15th. That is just to allow for time to process your materials, particularly the WES, if it applies to you, but also to give you additional time to think about things like visa processing and getting other factors lined up for you. Um, and again, there's plenty of time here. If you feel like you're ready to make the application, you can begin that process. 
one thing we will always encourage you is to not leave it to the last minute to get the application started. There's a good possibility that you might need assistance with certain parts of your materials. And every year we will have a scramble with people who we see have opened an application, have left it for a few months, and that's okay, but they've left it to the last few days before the deadline to get something over the line. Please avoid that. Reach out and talk to us around every question that you have, no matter how small it might be or how big it might be, we're here to make sure that we give you the answers that you need. Before I finish, I just want to draw your attention to two events. So if you are an applicant to the spring program and your application has yet to be submitted or it's missing some materials, or if you are one of those people who's thinking of a late dash to submit an application, I'm going to be holding an admissions clinic on October 26th. You will receive an email this afternoon letting you know about this, and you can have uh, the registration code here on the screen as well. This is just going to be informal walk-in hours where if you have any questions about your application for spring 2024, I will be available. You can just register. Um, we'll open up the room. You can come in. We'll have a group of people who will be asking questions. So we might take your questions on a group basis, but this will be a spot where you can reach out and have an opportunity to talk through any questions that you have. And I will also be available for one-to-one -one appointments as well if you're not able to make this. And then finally, before I do turn it over, the School of Professional Studies will be hosting an open house on, on the university campus on November 15th next month. This will be open to all prospective and current applicants to SPS programs across our master's degrees or certificate programs and other program types that you can see on the slide. If you are interested in attending, you can see the QR code at the bottom right hand here. You can scan that to begin the registration. But as you are here present in this webinar, you will also likely have already begun to receive communications about that. So if you are in the area, this would give you an opportunity to speak with program representatives on a one-to-one -one basis to ask any questions that you have and also get a chance to visit the campus, take a look at our facilities, and hear from other professional services as well, including our Career Design Lab, our International Students and Scholars Office, as well as our Student Financial Services folks as well. So that's going to be November 15th from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., and that will be at the Lowell Library on the Columbia campus. So that's going to pause it for here. I'm going to open it up for any questions that may have come through specific to admissions, and again, if you do have questions, you can reach out to us at the negotiation at sps.columbia.edu email alias. That's the primary contact for any questions you have about the program. If you've got questions that are more specific to the program, to Beth, you can send them to me and I will send them onwards to Beth and the program team. And we're also present on different strains of social media. So we have an active uh, LinkedIn group. We have an active Facebook and Instagram page as well. So I'm going to pause it here. I'm going to open it up for questions and um, just give me a moment or two to see what we may have. So I do see uh, one question here, David, that I was going to answer. So I said, are all online courses delivered asynchronously? So the majority of our online courses are asynchronous, which means that you have plenty of time. Usually it opens up and then you have a week or so to look at all the materials that stay open to you. But all of our asynchronous courses have synchronous components, and that could be a variety of ways of either just interacting one-on-one -on -one or in a small group with the professor, or it could be working with your teams and so on. So mostly asynchronous with some synchronicity, and of course, then we have the um, on-campus residency that's part of the hybrid program. And then we have another question, which is about an F-1 visa that is not my area of expertise. So I will let David manage that, but I believe that you'll be referred somewhere else because um, we don't deal, we of course we have people who do get visas, but we don't deal with that. Unless David, you have an answer for that. So, so I don't answer those questions. So it's worth two questions. Oh, there's something funny about the sound. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry, I'll just repeat that. So that's so that is so questions. So questions. Uh, David, we're not hearing you very clearly right now. Yes. So so I'll just say that um, if you have a visa question, please send it to David and he will be able to refer you to the uh, best place to get that answered. Okay, application materials. 
there was an additional information section at the bottom of the page and two additional questions that say please expand on why you're pursuing this program and what attracted you most to this program i'm just wondering are these two questions intended to be two extra supplemental essays or are they information for the admissions committee well yes there is can it be both does it have to be mutually exclusive it is more information and we would like you to answer that because we really want to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that fit is there. So what you're looking for, you will get satisfied in the program. And we want to make sure that you can blend in with the rest of the cohort of people that are coming in. So I would say to please answer both of those questions to the best of your ability to make a strong application, which is what you're trying to do, right? Okay, are there any other questions? We still have a few more minutes if people want to think about something. Again, if you don't think of a question now, but you know what happens is right after we hang up, you're going to say, oh, I should have asked that question. Then David is the person for you to contact. So I think if, can you hear me? Okay, so I think if we are at the end of our questions, I think we can conclude today's session. And just to reconfirm, a recording will go out within the next few working days, no later than early next week. So a big thank you to everyone for your time and your questions today. Very productive. And as Beth has said, any and all questions that you have, especially if you're like the Detective Columbo, you come back and ask one more question. Let us know. We will respond to those. It can take up to three working days for responses to come through, but we're normally pretty quick uh, with, with questions that you have. So I will leave it here. I will thank you for your time and wish you all a wonderful rest of the day.